The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the second chapter, the letter to the Ephesians. That's Ephesians chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 1 through 10 there this morning. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in this passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, may we hear what you would have us to hear, so that we may do, Lord, what you call us to do, that we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray, amen. When I was growing up, my sister, step-siblings, and I generally wore clothes that were first bought and worn by somebody else. Of course, most of our toys and dishes and small household appliances were also first bought and used by somebody else. We did a lot of shopping at thrift stores back before it was chic to do that sort of thing. I still have a hard time. You can ask Sally. I don't always like to go in them. But what we didn't buy at thrift stores, we picked up at local yard sales. I can remember going to some of those yard sales growing up, and I especially remember going with my Aunt Sharon. My Aunt Sharon was a pro at these sorts of things. She got up early on Saturday morning. She had the newspaper, knew the addresses where all the yard sales were going to be, knew which neighborhoods to drive through. And so she'd get up and make the rounds in her burgundy fox body Mustang every Saturday morning, and we'd go. It was always rather interesting to me, this whole concept of yard sales. I mean, have you ever stopped to think about it? Somebody gathers up all the stuff they don't want, and they won't sell it to you. <laughs> Maybe it's stuff they couldn't use. Maybe it's stuff they've long since replaced. Maybe it was that Christmas present they didn't have the heart to tell Mama they didn't want. But they gather it all up. Stuff they'd outgrown. Stuff they don't need. And they'd set it all on tables or lay it out on bed sheets in the yard to sell to folks driving by for maybe a handful of quarters. I suppose it beats throwing all of it away. While my mom, when she went, or my aunt would always look at like, things like clothes, you know, stuff you could use. Not me. I always like to look at the useless stuff. The useless stuff people throw away or try to sell, like old karate trophies. <laughs> Broken baskets. Pots without lids or handles, maybe somebody made out of an old broom or something. Workout equipment with all of the New Year's resolutions still hanging on them. Busted bowling balls, faded t-ball bats, rotary phones with wires that looked like they were just snatched out of the wall. And every once in a while, you'd hit the jackpot and find some old crate with records, but never any good ones. Always some old gospel group with wide lapel polyester suits standing on a step in front of like a courthouse or something, right? Or some ha metal hair band you've never heard of with wild hair and eye makeup on and songs you wouldn't dare listen to. Never any of the good stuff. 
I suppose I like looking at all that sort of stuff when I go to these yard sales. And to tell the truth, I still do like to look at that sort of stuff. Because all those sorts of things, to me, tell a story. Those sort of useless things tell stories about the folks, the kind of folks who would keep them, hold on to them for a while, only to come to a point one day where they go, I reckon I better let it go now. You know, when I really think about it, a yard sale may be one of the best ways to get to know a person. You learn where they've been. Oh, here's a coffee mug from Las Vegas. A worn out leather wallet from Sturgis, South Dakota. You know where they've been. The little cups from all over, right? You know what they like to do. Oh, on the table, there's a bunch of old Zebco 33 reels. All the rods are broken. Old tackle boxes missing the latches. You know they like to fish. You can tell where they went to college. Now, that's a little deceiving in Alabama because somebody could have never set foot in college and they got all kinds of Auburn and Alabama stuff. But usually if it's like Millanova, you know they're from out of state or something. You can tell how many kids they had, how long they've had them. Are the toys faded? Are they old? Does it look like eight three-year-olds have had it or only one? You can tell a lot of things about somebody by what they hold on to and how long they hold on to it. You all know what I'm talking about. What, what, what pattern of flowers are on the dishes? How long they have them. But perhaps more than anything else, what may be the biggest thing you can learn about somebody when they have a yard sale is that they're ready to let some things go. They're ready to move on. They're ready to make room for a change. I think that's why Phyllis Tickle used the image of a yard sale, or she's not from down here, she called it a rummage sale, when she observed the somewhat cyclical nature of church history. In her book, The Great Emergence, How Christianity is Changing and Why, she says, oh, about every 500 years or so, the church collective sort of clears out its attic gets rid of a bunch of stuff it doesn't need, uh, gets rid of some of the antiquated practices, dogmas, and traditions in order to make room for a few more, more appropriate ones. She says, if you look back, you can see about five, six hundred years after the beginning of the church, during the reign of what she calls Gregory the Great. She liked to frame it around all these greats. There was sort of a sign posted this first rummage sale of the church. It was around that time the Roman Empire started to crumble and the church that was wed so closely to it had to make some decisions. And it was then that there was the first real massive missionary effort outside of the Roman Empire under Gregory the Great. Another 500 years later, some uh, give or take, was what we call the Great Schism or Great Schism, depending on your accent, I guess. Happened around the year 1054, that's when we mark it, when the Western and Eastern churches divided into what we now call the Roman Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox Church. The split was not over the color of the carpet and stuff like that, but rather theological disputes about, well, where does the Holy Spirit come from? Does it come from Jesus? Does it come from the Father? Does it come from both? Where does it come from? Should we use leaven or unleavened bread? I wonder what our communion bread, how that would have come up in those conversations. But there were also some ecclesial arguments. Which pope is the real one, the one in Rome or the one in Constantinople? And they just decided to split. 500 years later, a little Augustinian monk wrote a paper called A Disputation on the Power of Indulgences. Real, real, real catchy title. Disputation on the power of indulgences. Indulgences were, were these uh, essentially paid-for promises. If you, if you paid a little bit of money towards the building of a church, then you'd get an indulgence. You'd either get a promise of you or one of your loved ones being freed from purgatory. This monk's name was Martin Luther, and he nailed his disputation, which we most often call the 95 Theses, to the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany, on October 31st of 1517. Quick, real quick, how long ago was that? About 500 years. So if Phyllis is right, we're either living on the verge of another shift, of another rummage sale in the history of the church, 
living on the verge of another reformation, another transformative uh, era as we continue on in the narrative of history. But I tend to think, I tend to think that we're knee deep in it. Some of us are looking down the road and we're right here in it. But I also don't necessarily think it's something that happens only every 500 years. But with the 500th anniversary of Luther's 95 Thesis, only a few days away, I can't help but reflect on these sorts of things. I can't help but wonder, what is it that causes us, believers, uh, uh, in the church in general, to always be changing? To be in a state of reformation, never settled on the things we believe to be right, true, and fully factual about what it means to live a life of faith. I mean, people will say, God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. But I've never heard anybody say, the church is the same today, yesterday, and forever, and not be lying about it. What is it? Why do we occasionally go through these rummage sales in the history of the church? Why do we occasionally drag all that stuff out of the attic and say, I don't think we need this anymore. We need something new. Some might say it's because we get bored. That might have been the case uh, early on in the church even, when Paul writes letters like this circular letter to the Ephesians that would have made its way around other churches. Maybe they said, well, you know, we've tried this for a while and nothing's really changed. We need something new. Maybe. Maybe the old ways of thing, doing things become trite, that we tend to come to a place where we need to shake things up a bit to keep ourselves interested, or we'll abandon the whole thing because it's not exciting anymore. I suppose that's true for some things. I can buy it for some things. I mean, there's a reason people buy this year's version of a video game and not just keep playing last year's right now. Now, this, this sort of tells you I know nothing about video games. I was going to say that's why you buy Super Mario Brothers 3 after you play Super Mario Brothers 2, but that may date me way too much. But there's a reason. There's a reason we'll watch reboots of our favorite TV shows and movies. Not because there was anything wrong with the old ones, but because we've watched it so much, we know it line by line, and we like the story, but we need a fresh take on it, right? Maybe. Sure, we get bored with things when they don't change, but I'm not really convinced that's why believers in the church go through these seasons of reformation. Now, someone might say it's because the times change, that we know more now than we did then, and I can get behind that to a point, I mean, we definitely know more things now than Paul did then, than the disciples did then, than Martin Luther did then. I mean, most of us, most of us know the world is round. There are some folks holding out on that, I guess. Most of us know that the world is round. Most of us know that it goes around the sun. We have a much deeper knowledge of the cosmos and the amount of life on our planet than we've ever had. We know more about genetics, biology, chemistry, physics, and all of those things help us to know ourselves and our world better. And yeah, some of those things have caused us and are still causing us to ask very serious questions about some long-held beliefs and interpretations of Scripture and theology. But is the natural progression of knowledge enough to cause the church to enter into these seasons of Reformation? I don't know. Of course, some will point to the, the always seemingly shifting culture of the world as a, a catalyst for change in the church. There was no doubt some of Paul's uh, uh, very wrestling ideas was the, the way that culture was drastically different and shifting in the Roman Empire. Not much different today. Seems it's always shifting and moving. Some will praise these changes as a sign of progress, while others will bemoan such a change as a, a sign of moving away from more centralized traditional values. Some will call for the church to resist change. Others will call for the church to embrace change. And still others will call for the church to be the lead in change. And a, the cultural progress and change while it is indeed a powerful force, and it's led to many positive differences in the history of the church, and it's led to many unfortunate accommodations in the history of the church. But is it what really lies at the heart of a Reformation? When I read church history, 
When I look back on all of those movements and moments that might be truly considered as reformations within the church, as drastic changes, I don't see people who were bored. I don't think Martin Luther had nothing better to do in Wittenberg. Nor do I see those who are only responding to the wellspring of new knowledge or seismic shifts within our own cultures. You see, whether it's Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses to the door at the church or whether it's Martin Luther King Jr. proclaiming his dream on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, whether it's a monk named Francis somewhere in Assisi trying to call others to a life of selflessness and peace, or a woman named Frances trying to raise people out of poverty in Perry County, Alabama, whether it's a group of people called Protestants, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Baptists, Anabaptists, Puritans, Pentecostals, or emergent Christians, whatever name we may give them, whatever the case may be, each and every time there's been some measurable movement, some reformation within or across the fabric of the universal church, if it has thrived and continued on, it has not been because they got the right answer. It has not been because they've got it all figured out. It's not been because they said, we have the final solution and they were right. If any movement has thrived and continued on, it is because those who were a part of it genuinely sought to follow Jesus. Not because they had it all figured out but because Jesus was always there ahead of them, calling them farther on down the road. You and I are here in this place because there were those before us who believed in that onward call from Jesus. You and I are here in this place because, well, believing that Jesus is the one who still calls us on to not be the same yesterday as we are today, it's why we gather around the waters for baptism. We don't just say, well, we've done it once and that's enough. Whether your hair is still wet from the water or whether it's long since dried from your memory, we still gather because we know Jesus is still calling us through those waters, still calling us on into this life of faith. It's why we gather around the Lord's table. This is not the last time we do this. We never just show up and say, well, I'm going to take this, this bread and this cup, and I'll never have to do it again. It's why we gather, because here's the truth, folks. I don't know what it means. I don't know if it's the body and blood of Jesus. I don't know if it's just a symbol. I don't know if it's just supposed to, to remind us of something or call us forward in something. But I do know every time I come to the table, Every time we in this room gather around it, somehow, some way, Jesus is there and always calling us on. That's why we do it. That's why we come to this room week after week. If any of you leaves today and says, I don't think I need to come back. I got it all figured out. Could you come see me tomorrow and let me know? Because I don't know. We come week after week. We say we do the same things. We sing the same songs. We read the same Bible. We do it week after week because we haven't gotten there yet. We haven't figured it out. It's why we read this book over and over again. Nobody picks it up and reads through it like it's war and peace and says, I think I got it figured out now. You read it over and over. It's why we pray over and over. We say, I don't know what I'm praying for half the time, but I pray because Jesus is always there calling us. Calling us on. Because we haven't reached the end. Because we know we haven't settled it all. Because we know there's still a long, winding way stretched out before us. And Christ is there calling us. Always ahead of us. Always ahead of us calling us on, maybe even on to another reformation. He's calling us on. Are you willing to go on with him this morning? Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Lord, you call us ever on in this journey of faith. And Lord, as we have gathered this morning 
around the waters of baptism. May you remind us, God, of our own and how far you've brought us from it. And now, Lord, as we gather around your table, we pray that you bless, Lord, this cup, this bread, this time we spend together. Lord, we may not know what it means. We may not have it all figured out. But, Lord, we trust that you're here. And when we gather together, we hear your voice calling us on. So call us on, Lord Jesus, as we gather around the table. And help us to respond to your presence. In your holy name we pray. Amen.